Oh, hi, I'm Alan Gannett. And I'm Shane Snow. And you're listening to Creative Hotline, the call and advice show dedicated to helping creatives reach their full potential. Today, we're answering questions about our relationships as creative people with our audiences. So in a previous episode, Alan and I started getting into a friendly disagreement about the difference between creating for ourselves and for an audience. And whether it's even possible to create art without an audience in mind, And it turns out that some of our listeners have had questions along these lines as well. Like, what's the ideal relationship between a creative person and their audience? And when is the right time to bring in audience feedback? How does that fact that audiences and their ideas and values are always changing over time, how does that factor into how we should think about our own creative process? All that and more in this episode of Creative Hotline. Creative Hotline, leave your question at the... Hi, Shane and Alan. This is Stephanie from LA. And my question is, how do you differentiate creating for yourself and creating for others? And how do you seek that balance? Because from my experience, if we only created for ourselves with the hopes of sharing our work, I don't think it really resonates well with the audience. And when I create solely for others that also has proven not to really resonate with the audience. What do you believe is a healthy balance or approach to our creative work? And what questions do you think we should be asking ourselves? So I love this question. I mean, I think it's the perfect question to start off this topic. For me, I feel like I have a pretty strong opinion on this, which I'm curious to see if you agree or disagree. But I don't think it's possible to create art. I'm going to emphasize the word art without considering your audience. I think if you are creating something purely for yourself, to me, that's craft. That is sort of showing off your skill to yourself, that's developing something. But I think art really, this sort of social dynamic of art, the context of art, that is really what makes art art. I mean, I think about why, you know, in Art Basel, they had the banana that was taped to the wall and right. sold for $150,000. And people were like, is it art? And like, yeah, it was art. But it was also, it was a social commentary about the art world, the dynamic, the reaction, that was all part of it. When you think about pop art or you know, any of these sort of big art movements, they were always in context to sort of the world that was going on. It was in reaction to things like that is the art. The reaction is the art. I think otherwise, I think it's craft. So you've never made something beautiful just for yourself to enjoy, or you don't imagine painters painting things and hanging them up on their own wall for them to enjoy rather for them than for other people. I think that that is craft and skill and things can be beautiful without being art. So for example, there's lots of things that we look at in the world and we're like, wow, those are beautiful, right? Like mountains are beautiful. Certain people are beautiful. We're all beautiful, but certain people are especially (laughs) beautiful. And I think we can look at that and appreciate the the beauty of something, but that doesn't make it art. Like that's why art to me has always been this funny thing where we a lot of times struggle to wrap our heads around it because it's not just about, oh, he or she is a talented painter. Like lots of people are talented painters, but they're not artists. There's this big difference there to me. So I I think that some of this may be about uh, terminology, you know, what word we say and what we mean when we say it. Uh, You know, I'm thinking about when we talked about how creativity and craft are two components, right? The robots are rising up and they're getting good at things like craft, you know, the work that goes into uh, making something after you invent it, imagine it, you know, create the concept for it. But that creating the concept for it, that's... To me, that's part of the art. Uh, and uh, and if you make a painting for yourself, so I, I think about my grandpa. My grandpa is a landscape painter, doesn't show anybody his paintings. But at age 80, he picked up painting. He goes, he paints landscapes every day. He loves doing it. And his house is full of these paintings. And he loves it. And he enjoys it. You could say he's a craftsman. And I think that would be true. But he is very creative with it. And he's not doing it for other people. So my, my pushback on the... Uh, and, and I think that, you know, that's the point of, of this sort of thing, right, is, uh, is disagreeing is interesting. We get to explore it. But my pushback on what you're saying that art is only art if other people see it or if there's an audience. Otherwise, it's just a beautiful thing. I think about there's this uh, there's this 
thing that a, a friend of mine who's a, a filmmaker says all the time, um, longtime collaborator with me, he always says this thing that I don't know if this is true either, but you can tell me if this resonates, that uh, artists, especially he thinks about with filmmakers at first, early in your career, you're creating for other people. You're trying to create things that other people will enjoy, that will maybe be commercial or help elevate you. But then at a certain point in your career, you start creating things that you want to create, things for you, whether the audience likes it or not, you're going to do it. And then at a certain point in your career, uh, kind of once you've matured more or you're you're leaving a legacy or whatever, you start creating things that are good for the world, whether or not mm. people like them or whether or not it's what you want to do. And he always uses these examples of filmmakers that do this. I think of writers that early on they're writing, you know, for the newspaper, they're writing, you know, ghost writing Hardy Boys novels. And then eventually they get to start writing what they want. They don't care if they sell because they've made their money. I just don't know if that's true. Like I, we know a lot of professional artists and I think most of the people who are successful artists, which by the way, there's a big, there's a lot of unsuccessful artists. Like I think that's an mm -hmm. important point to hit home. Most of the like very successful artists I know really revel in the sort of interaction, either even if it's on a conceptual level with the audience. Like that's part of the exciting of like what they're doing. And I always think about uh, Mihai Checks and Mihai, which I talk about a lot, wrote the book Flow, sort of the granddaddy of the sort of study of creativity within sociology. He has this story, this anecdote he uses that I like, which is he says, you know, I went on a trip to Africa and I was in a market and I saw this beautiful wooden mask and I was taken by it and I went and bought it and I brought it back to my house. And one day a friend who was African came by and he was like, oh, you bought the mask. And <laughs> he was like, what? He's like, yeah, everyone buys that mask. It's like, it's the mask they sell at all of the tourist places. I'm sort of, you know, yeah. messing up the story a little bit, but you sort of get the point. And he realized that just because it was beautiful didn't mean it was art. It was basically a tchotchke. And he makes this point of when it comes to art, there is a social recognition that goes on to sort of what we define as this is art or that is art. Because otherwise, if I asked you to say like, well, here's a painting, is it creative or not? Well, it depends completely. Like when was it made? Who was it made by? If you went and painted a perfect reproduction of the Mona Lisa, it would be skilled, but I think you would agree it's not creative. And so there's a weird, there's a line there that is actually like quite nuanced and I think quite social. I I mean, I, I get the social part. I mean, I think that is a huge part of how we collectively recognize art. Um, but, you know, the cliche art is in the eye of be the beholder. I think that a lot of people like things or think of things as art that other people don't. And, uh, and you know, you could disagree that it's in the eye of the beholder. But, uh, but that's so social. So here's my trump card that I've been waiting to pull out. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is fascinating. I believe that this is perhaps a matter of uh, of just uh, you know vocabulary, perhaps a matter of personality. Uh, but for me, I have a secret poetry blog that I write that nobody can see that I've been is writing for years for me that I use sometimes as an outlet. But often I will reread it as a way to uh, to enjoy myself. It's part of my, you could say, craft. But I consider it, in my beholder's eye, art that I'm making for no one, just for my own satisfaction in the same way that I would go read someone else's art for my satisfaction. And I would say that there are people who do that who... I, I'm not going to tell them that what they're doing isn't art, even though no one else is seeing it. Maybe the social dynamic is just with myself, but that's something that I do. I don't know if that's art. I don't know if I agree. <laughs> I, 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 think it, I think just because we say I made art doesn't mean you made art. Because like clearly there's a line. Um, there's clearly a line where it goes from just like, I think we would also like, would you say something that is like really like mediocre? Is that still art? 
If people think it is, right? I mean, that's the banana thing, right? If people think it. There's a social. <laughs> keep bringing the social dynamic. We should. We should. We are. We should keep moving. Yeah. Well, so why don't we get back to Steph's question? You know, yeah. the balance between creating for yourself and your audience. Uh, you know, I think that whether we're defining it as art or not, you're creating something for someone, whether it's for yourself or the audience. The balance between how much you're taking into account what they want or they need versus what you want or what you need, which I think ties into my friend's thing about at a certain point, you don't need to make money. You don't need to make everyone happy. You want to make things that are going to push the world forward or get people to think, even if it makes them uncomfortable. But at a certain in, in certain kinds of situations, you want to create things that are not, you know, that the audience, I guess, even in that case, you're thinking about the audience. Yeah, that's why I don't agree because like I'm reading Matthew McConaughey's memoir and he talks about how he made this shift from rom-coms to serious work, but his whole context of it is that he wanted to win an Oscar and like be a serious guy. Like it was all about how the people viewed him. So you think that, would it be fair to say that you think that the balance is it's all about the audience? I think that it's all about the audience and maybe the, the middle ground between us is if the audience is just you, that's okay, but that is all it is then. And so I think it, to whatever degree you want to build awareness of what you're doing and have an impact, if you want to have an impact on a huge amount of people, you have to have a huge amount of people in mind as you're working. So maybe this will be helpful to Steph after bring <laughs> us a twist through this. If you're making something and you're making it for you, then think about what's going to make you happy, what's going to push you to think differently, what's going to push, you know, what art will uh, accomplish satisfying you. And if you're making it for someone else, then actually think about them before you think about yourself. And if you're not making it for anyone, send it up in a rocket, send it out to space and we'll say it's not art. So I think I think we have had a, this is truly an area where we might disagree, but I think our middle ground is middle is decent enough. We'll take yeah, it. We'll, we'll take, take it. it. <laughs> um, Thanks, with that, it's time for a segment, a game, some might say called Please Don't Hack Me. Here's how it works. I will read Shane a series of real password reset questions that I found on the internet, and he has three seconds to guess my answer for each one. Now, there's some complicated scoring involved. For every one he gets right, he gets plus one point. For every one he gets wrong, he loses one point. His goal, five points to successfully hack me. Shane, are you ready? You know, I used to do this in high school and I had a pretty good success rate. So I'm be a hacker. Totally ready. I would just guess all my friends password reset mm. passwords because it's always like their football jersey number or like their mm. dog's name or whatever. So I'm, I'm ready for this. OK, let's see how you do. These are real security questions. OK. And you, oh, you only get three seconds to answer each one. So yep. don't be slow. First question first. What was my favorite sport in high school? Nothing. You got it right. Very good. All right. So that was, that's plus one. What is, cheering needs to stop. What is my pet's name? Maven. Oh my God, you're killing it. How many bones have I broken? Two? Uh -uh. Zero minus one. Wow, you've disaster. broken no bones, no broken bones ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're you're careful and and indestructible guy. That makes Let's sense. Let's don't play sports. <laughs> what is the title and artist of my favorite song? Oh, uh, uh, uh don't stop believing. Shit, that's a terrible guess. Why would you Style like by Taylor Swift. This hacking was, is not going well. What is the title and author? I, I thought that would be too... Uh, no, go with your instinct, Shane. Okay. What is the title and author of my favorite book? Oh, this one's easy, Alan. It's Dream Teams by Shane Snow. <laughs> Great book, wrong answer. <laughs> what is my favorite movie? Uh, your favorite movie is... I'm going to go with The Matrix 3. You are really just not hacking me successfully. It would, the answer to both of the last two questions is A Single Man by Christopher Isherwood. Favorite book, favorite movie. That movie, we just watched it, Sylvia and it's I. So and bad. It's so gorgeous. Yeah, I mean, stunning. Like, stunning. 
I, it made me want to buy all Tom Ford stuff. In fact, <laughs> you know, Tom Ford people are listening to this podcast. Will you sponsor the show? I will wear all of your stuff and talk about it every day. Forever. Yeah. It's forever. a real burden that you carry wearing Tom Ford forever. Um, what is my favorite TV program? Uh, Wheel of Fortune. Excuse me. This is really, I thought you knew me so well. I was on Wheel of Fortune when I was 19. So Shane is like subtly making fun of me here. Um, what is, I, the, the ones that I know are easy. The ones that I don't know, I, I, need to take a process of deduction. So the three second limit, I think is actually a great thing in real time. This is why I'm very hacker proof. Yeah. What is my favorite color? Green. I'm wearing it. It's blue. I was trying Uh, to help you here. This was uh, really, okay. We have just a couple more, three more. What is my preferred musical genre? Pop. Oh, pop punk. I grew up in New Jersey in the 2000s. Oh, I mean, that that's still your favorite? Yes. Oh, Nostalgia. Someone said that, so on a previous episode, I sang a, you know, a Drake clip. And one of uh, our listeners said it sounded like a pop punk version of a Drake clip. Oh, well, Which, they, have, they have good let's taste. Let's take it as a compliment. Yeah. Two last questions. Here, let's see if you have redemption. These are both double or nothing because um, okay. you are really not doing well. <laughs> what year did I graduate from high school? 2008. 2009. Wow. We are. Last question. This will be triple or nothing. <laughs> what was my dream job as a child? I think you wanted to be a CEO. Oh, a lawyer. I was really not a little masochistic there. All right. So you started off so strong. You got two points right in a row and then you were negative nine. So you were negative seven. That is not good. So Shane, you have failed to hack me. My security is simply too secure. I think it's probably for the best. I don't want to know what's in there. (laughs) To the, to the voicemail. Hi, Alan and Shane. This is Jess from New York. I have a question for you about art that isn't appreciated in its time. Um, I think obviously we can all think of a million examples of artists who weren't truly celebrated until after their death, but more and more we're seeing artists whose work we sort of reconsider as society evolves. Obviously, Woody Allen is a very topical example of that at the moment. Um, But I guess my question is, when doing creative work, do you consider the current state of the audience you're producing for? Or is it your responsibility as an artist to sort of create art that, that looks forward? Thank you. Well, so I, I think this is a really chewy question because my instinct is to say uh, creating stuff that lasts is a, a goal of mine as a, you know, as a writer, especially. I want to create things that will still be on people's bookshelves 10 years from now. My life dream would be to make movies or books that a hundred years from now people still think about and know about. But I think the, uh, the twist on this, first of all, that I don't think is everyone's goal and shouldn't be. Some stuff is beautiful and great because it's ephemeral. Uh, but the, the part about thinking through how audiences may change and how that might affect the way they see your work, that is giving me a little bit of anxiety thinking about that. Uh, I, I, what do you think, Alan? So I love this question. And there's a, I feel like we have a lot of mythology around this type of question. So I, I hear this question two ways. One, I hear this sort of someone creating now, how do they think about the future? And then obviously also she's talking about reconsidering people from the past, which I think is an interesting part of it too. I think thinking about the future, the person who always comes to mind on this is Van Gogh. And Ooh. I'm working on a new project where I ended up spending a bunch of time researching Van Gogh. I read a lot of his old letters. I read a bunch of his biographies. And what I think is funny about Van Gogh is we actually misunderstand a lot about Van Gogh. So Van Gogh, there's sort of two things we misunderstand. One is we have these sort of tropes of him as, you know, he was languishing in obscurity uh, and only years after he died did anyone find out about him. And that is not the story of Van Gogh at all. So this is actually really interesting. So the story of Van Gogh, was he was sort of languishing in obscurity. And then right before he died, he sort of became this viral sensation. So mm. at a Paris art show, I forget the exact name of it. It was like, I think it's like the Salon of Independence or something. He was like the belle of the ball. Like everyone was obsessed really? with him. Yeah, he was, he like blew up. 
And then he like immediately died. And the fact that he died sort of added to his legacy and mystique and his legend in the Uh same way that a lot of times when musicians die, you know, in the prime of their moments, like we sort of mythologize them even more. And so he was actually not someone who was languishing in obscurity and his death actually built, helped build up this sort of moment that he was having when he died. And he died on top. He got, he got to see the, the fruits of his labor. And what's funny is he also was like famously would write all these letters. And some of the letters are actually kind of funny. I pulled out a quote that I liked because it's so relevant for this question. Um, okay, so here was, the, here was the quote. Because a lot of his letters are about how like he doesn't care what people think, right? So like mm-hmm. here's one letter. This is to his brother, who is also his art dealer. He said, you're enough of a judge of painting to see and to appreciate what originality I may have. And you're also enough of a judge to see the pointlessness of presenting to today's public what I'm doing because the others surpass me in more precise brushwork. It has more to do with the wind and circumstances than with what I could do with the mistral. I don't know what that means. And without these inevitable circumstances of vanished youth and relative poverty. For my part, I'm in no way set of changing my situation, and I actually count myself only to be happy to be able to continue it as it is. So he's like also played into this notion, but yet like he's like, I don't care about fame. But he literally wrote all of these letters to his brother, who's his dealer, and all of his letters are about fame, basically. They're all about <laughs> like him like, oh, like, oh, like he just constantly won't shut up about it. <laughs> So he's he's uh, he's trying to make my point about how it doesn't matter if people see your art, but what he's actually kind of making is your point is that that's really what he cares about is the audience. he's obsessed with it. Like all he wants is like to be famous. <laughs> uh, it's it's interesting because uh, when I hear this question, I think about uh, have you ever heard of Whig history? No. So the Whigs, uh, political party in uh, in British Parliament. Uh, centuries ago, did this thing where they decided to uh, rewrite all of the history books and uh, kind of in favor of their current, you know, way of thinking. And, uh, you know, this is something that we do with history books, you know, the the victors get to write the history. But the, the concept of Whig history was sort of born out of this idea of judging the past based on today's standards. Hmm. And I think there is a thing that we do now, especially that is, I, I think, uncharitable to people in the past, where we pull out who they were, what they did centuries ago, decades ago, even a few years ago, when standards were different, when what they were doing was not considered unacceptable socially by their standards. And now, by our standards, we know better, we're more, we've matured as a society. And so we look at it and we say, that's not cool. F them, right? And uh, and that thing, I think there's something, uh, maybe dangerous is the wrong word, but, but certainly uncharitable about that, where if you think about a kid does something that's wrong or awful, and they don't know it's wrong or awful, we don't, when they're an adult, punish them for that. That would be- But I think that there's a big, there's a big nuance there that's hard to like, to know, because like, let's use a really weighty topic. Like let's use sure. slavery, right? There were abolitionists. Yes. So like you know, there were plenty of people who knew it was wrong. It wasn't like people were like, I wonder if this is wrong. Like there were plenty of people who were like, this is clearly wrong. Yes. Well, so I think there's a big difference between that. And I, I think also saying this before addressing the Woody Allen thing might might get anyone who stopped before this point uh, upset. Stuff that is morally wrong in your time that is seen as morally wrong or that is at a very human, visceral, emotional level, something that we know better and would have known better then is a different story than saying, uh, because now we've evolved to the point where we have nuanced views of things that they just simply didn't then uh, and people were ignorantly doing wrong. I think that we need to uh, to look at the things like that through more of a charitable lens of people who are meaning well, but they are doing what we consider bad now while meaning well uh, because they don't know better. That's different than people who are. I agree. Like how well. sometimes with language, there's language that we wouldn't use today that in the past exactly. people use at the time was not considered even questionable sort of from a morality perspective and like, you know. I, I think that's exactly it. Language and subject matter that today is uh, is taboo because language has changed. 
but back then wouldn't have been. Or back then, you know, people hadn't encountered people across the world. They didn't even know that elephants existed. Mm -hmm. So there's things that they said that now we look at them and we're like, wow, that sounds like a euphemism. That's terrible. But in the time, you know, if we look into it, uh, we, we should first seek to understand whether they knew what they were talking about before we decide that it's awful. So it is a nuanced thing. But I think with, you know, with the Woody Allen question or with artists that, uh, you know, we look at now, things have come out about who they were that uh, they should have known better. And, uh, and you know, and, and we don't like what we see. I think what do we do about their art is uh, maybe a subject for a whole other day. You know, can the you art, appreciate the artist would be a good topic? Yeah. Can you appreciate something that comes from someone who you think is awful? Uh, you know, they, they always talk about how Hitler went to art school. What if he made... <laughs> You know, what if he made Shame. the statue David? <laughs> like we wouldn't want to, we wouldn't want that. But, uh, but I think some people could argue that it was still beautiful. And that, uh, that really fucks with my head. <laughs> Let's go to a game. I can't deal with that. <laughs> All right. We're going to segue to something a little lighter. This is a segment called to cave or not to cave. Okay. In this segment, I'm going to give Alan three scenarios that really happened about audience backlash to a film or TV show. And Alan's going to guess in which of these scenarios did the audience not get their way. So basically, this is a trivia game of which one of these did not happen. So are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. After the DC Comics film Justice League fired the director Zack Snyder, a new version of the movie by a different director was released and panned by audiences. Later, audiences demanded to see the version that Zack Snyder made. And so after denying that such a cut existed, the studio finally caved, acknowledged it did exist, and gave Zack Snyder $70 million to fix it. And it's now a four-hour film called Zack Snyder's Justice League. That's the first one. Second one, a French film called Cuties, had enormous backlash from viewers over its poster, which had 11-year-old girls dressed in a way that looked like it was promoting pedophilia. So Netflix removed the film. And the third is the sci-fi TV show The Expanse was about to get canceled after poor viewership, but then fans freaked out, started an online campaign, and got it two extra seasons from Amazon, Notably because one of those fans was Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos himself. So, Alan, which of these audience backlash stories is not true? So, the first one, I know nothing about comics. It sounds true. Like, I just feel like comic, comic book fans are intense. I'm sure there's some comic book fans who are listening. You're intense in a good way, right? You support <laughs> your art. So, I buy that. That's true. The second one, I remember hearing a lot about, so I, I'm going to come back to that one. That one feels suspicious because I kind of feel like they didn't they didn't do that. I feel like they didn't pull it. The third one, I know nothing about. Like that is, you are, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so I'm going to go with number two. I feel like I remember... I remember a bunch about this and I remember there was controversy, but I feel like it didn't actually get pulled. I feel like they pulled the marketing campaign, but they didn't pull the actual film. How'd I do? So I'm devastated that you don't know The Expanse. I'm, I guess maybe I shouldn't be surprised. It's the greatest show on television right now. No, I didn't uh, Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos likes it. I don't know if that sways you one way or the other. Uh, I once gave a speech at NBC Universal and I begged the sci-fi team not to cancel the expanse and they sold it to Amazon. Uh, so You're I influential. Have, yeah, You're I, influential. I take credit for the expanse. But uh, but if you can cue the success music. I am delighted to inform you that yes. Uh, the second one is false. So it is true that Cuties got an enormous backlash. They tried to cancel it. The, the audience tried to cancel it because the poster looked like it was promoting pedophilia. So Netflix apologized, though, and changed the poster and kept the film. And they also acknowledged, they tried to let people know that taken out of context, the poster did look like it could be offensive. But actually, once you see the film, it's not offensive. And that's why they made that call. 
Uh, so they didn't remove the film. They changed the poster because without context, it looked like it could be bad. And then people watched the film and they kind of, the, the campaign petered out because people realized that they were wrong about the backlash. Look at me. I, I won so far. Yeah. So far, we are, we are, we are zero one winner <laughs> over here and Mr. Can't Hack Me over there. With I, that. It's well-deserved, Alan, this, yeah. this time. But that's I'll the get last word. Time. We're just, that's, we're just going to leave it on. I'm a winner. Um, <laughs> let's go to the voicemail. Hi, this is Tally from Brooklyn, New York. I was wondering how soon in your creative process do you start thinking about the audience? Like when a creative idea takes place, do you right away think about who is this for and how is it going to impact them? Or do you just let yourself make something because you just want to make it for a while first? Thanks so much. So I, I like this question because it's, it's subtly different than, uh, than the first one. This one's about timing, right? Not about if, uh, you know, it, it's about when. I think about this sort of thing in terms of audience feedback or collecting data on creativity and, and the tension between trying to show people something new, create something new, while also trying to make sure that you're not creating something so far in that uh, people don't get it. Uh, either that it's ahead of its time and you die and it becomes popular or it just it doesn't work. I think for me, the recommendation that I would give is have a, a sort of a two-part process to your creation. Explore when you're feeling like exploring, you know, push your boundaries, seek out things. Uh, you know, if you're a musician, play around. And then at a certain point, you want to take what you've explored and cull it down into something that uh, that can be appreciated or that that works better. And I think that culling period is when I tend to bring in the audience or editors or reviewers or feedback. But I would say that just because someone gives you feedback or you get data from the audience doesn't mean that you have to take the feedback, that you have to do what they suggest. For me, I think bringing in the audience is about gauging what's not working. And then as the creative person, as the artist, I then try to solve the problem, but I don't have to solve the problem in the way that people are suggesting. I can thank them for showing me what's not working and then I can try and find other creative solutions. So that's the way that I handle this. But I know we're all different. And, and Alan, I suspect you have a bit of a different process. I, I actually, I mean, I'm pretty similar. And I think most people are pretty similar. I actually think this is a very misunderstood thing. So, you know, we have a lot of friends who are writers sort of by just context of being writers. And I'm sh sort of shocked by the gap where I think most audience members don't realize how feedback driven most of these crafts are. So most writers, so here's the big secret, right? Most writers are really intense about feedback reads. They get feedback readers. They're intentional about who they get as feedback readers, when they solicit the feedback. You know, a lot of, a lot of people try and build a group of sort of diverse feedback readers. So you get different perspectives on what you're, on what you're writing. And I know for most writer friends, like that is a huge part of the process. And for myself, I literally, I feel like I couldn't successfully write without that. If I was just writing without some outside context, I would miss the mark because you get in your head, you sort of can't quite tell when you're writing exactly what's going to land or not land. And you need that outside perspective. And Shane has been a feedback reader for me. I've been a feedback reader for Shane. And this isn't just for sort of written word, but it's also, I mean, movies, films, like I think about screenwriters, for example, screenwriters are like obsessed with feedback. Like the whole idea in Hollywood of notes and of, you know, oh, we're going to get notes and, you know, incorporate those. Like that's a huge part from a time perspective of the process of creating a movie and creating a screenplay. And so I, I, you know, music, for example, think about like collaborators and how people go into a studio and they get feedback from the producers and the engineers and all this, like feedback is essential to the process because going back to our first point, which I was right on, because you're creating for an audience you can't just create in your own head, right? Unless you're creating for an audience of one, which who would do that? Then you, know, <laughs> you need to incorporate outside feedback. So I, I usually, to answer this question precisely, I usually will write a pretty tight first draft and then collect feedback. And I'd say the feedback mark is probably my 50% mark. So it's still you know, about half of the sort of creative process to go when I'm soliciting feedback. How about you? Yeah, I, I like to do feedback in chunks. I like to get feedback before it's going to be so 
psychologically painful to change things. You know, I don't want to get through the whole draft the, or the whole manuscript, you know, and then realize that I've screwed something up in the first chapter that affects the whole book. Uh, so I like to get feedback in chunks. I like to de-risk the potential for feedback becoming catastrophic um, by doing it in chunks. And I like to compartmentalize people so that, uh, you know, different people are giving me feedback at different times. Uh, I think that if you want to uh, explore further or deeper than you have before in your art or than other people have before in your art, do that exploration longer before you get the feedback. That's fine. But you need to detach your identity and your sense of worth from the feedback when it comes. So the longer you spend on something, the more it can hurt you personally if you, don't, if you get feedback you don't like. I think uh, I want to bring up something that, that you said, though, Alan about uh, uh, readers taking a look at your stuff. You know, Jess's question that we just answered a few minutes ago about, uh, you know, I guess uh, future-proofing your work. One of the things that I do as a matter of course with my books or with long articles that I know are going to have like a long shelf life is I have sensitivity readers where I will send out my manuscript to people who don't share my perspectives, you know, uh, to people of color. If I'm writing about anything that would potentially be, you know, uh, have someone of color would have a different perspective than me where I'm white. Uh, I tend to actually try to get as many demographically and generationally diverse people as possible to read my stuff so that I can know if something I'm saying that I don't think is going to be distracting or offensive might actually be distracting or offensive to someone who's 18 or to someone who's 65. Uh, totally. so I, mean, I, 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 I do that because part of the, like a lot of times my sense of humor, my jokes don't land for people who are not in my sort of within a decade plus or minus. And I've had to learn that I need to get that feedback because otherwise I'm like making these jokes that are only funny to me and like five other people. <laughs> yeah. And, and you don't want to distract the audience from the point that you're trying to make or from the art that you're trying to, to show them. So it's not about taking the fun out of it by, by trying to be overly PC. It's about making sure that you can focus people on what you want them to focus on and not get on side tangents because you screwed up or you had a blind spot. Yeah, for sure. So this has been a really fun episode, Alan. Yeah. And, you know, if you, yeah, you listening have a question for us on anything creativity related that you'd like to hear, well, visit creativehotlineshow.com from your phone or computer to leave us a voicemail. We are here to answer your questions. So in our next episode, we're going to be taking some very juicy questions about the nature of identity when it comes to creative work. It's going to be fascinating and a little nerve wracking, if I may say so. Oh, and if you like this episode, we could use your help. Yes, yes. Just pause for a second. We could use your help. We need you to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. So really, every review we get gets us closer to our dream of one day being trillionaires. So... <laughs> At the very least, help us out. But if you want to just help other people find the show, please leave us a re review. We would really appreciate it. Bye, Shane. <laughs> Bye, Alan. Bye.